an affluent suburb, an unlikely place for a horrifying murder. I knew the kid was gonna, you know, gonna get killed, and I still, I, I didn't, I didn't stop it. By 1984, teen violence, along with teen drug use, began to appear in towns all across America. No town was too small, and for four young lives, one night of malice and misfortune would forever change their community and shock the nation. Physically, it was the worst crime I've ever seen. Media around the world reported Satan in the suburbs of New York City. These kids had engaged in some pretty bizarre behavior with their satanic cultism. Teenagers out of control. The amount of drugs was really, truly extraordinary. And no one to blame but the devil himself. A lot of people didn't look at this murder and take it as a wake-up call, say, we have a problem here. It's a typical summer night in a typical American suburb. Four teenage kids are just killing time in their usual way by slipping into the woods to do some drugs. The four had been here before. It was one of their favorite spots to sit around and do absolutely nothing. But this night was somehow different from all others. This time, it was different. There was three crows flying all around us, and that Ricky did say out at that time that Satan's with us. I'm high at the time, I'm on 10 hits of acid, so I was like, yeah, he is, whatever. Ricky was 17-year-old Ricky Casso, no stranger to trouble. He had been busted for small-scale burglaries and other petty crimes. Known for his drug dealing and devotion to satanic rituals, Ricky's evening was about to get a whole lot more interesting. Lately, his problem was his so-called friend, Gary Lowers. Word was he had stolen 10 bags of angel dust from Ricky. Ricky was out to get him. The night began like any other night in the woods. The four friends did what came naturally. They got high on drugs, enjoyed the nighttime sky, and got high some more. But what began as a party quickly turned into a nightmare. I knew exactly what was going on, and I still, I was, I, I didn't, I didn't stop it. Four had entered the woods that night, but only three had come out. Whatever happened was to be a secret, but not for long. Two weeks passed, but no one seemed to miss Gary Lowers. Not his friends, certainly not the police, not even his parents. After all, Gary was a frequent runaway. From the outside, Gary's hometown looked so serene, but it was no ordinary place. His friends were no ordinary kids, and they had committed no ordinary crime. An eerie calm settled over the three remaining friends. Gary was gone, but in death, Ricky found him more interesting than ever. From the looks of it, he felt no remorse. And instead of a compulsion to confess, Ricky felt the need to share his deed with his friends. He led 
contours to the body. Their friends looked on with morbid curiosity as maggots colonized the remains. Ricky seemed satisfied with his work and proud to show it off. In those two weeks, a dozen people saw what was left of Gary Lowers, but no one breathed a word of it. Maybe they thought Ricky would kill them too. Located just an hour and a half outside of New York City, the predominantly white, upper-middle-class suburban town of Northport, New York, appealed to parents looking for good schools and clean living. Problem was, their kids were bored. And in the summer of 1984, the devil made work for idle hands. After about a week, Ricky lost interest in his departed friend. He and Jimmy decided to close the show and bury him in a shallow grave. And when we went to kick it in the grave that we dug, the, um, the head actually fell off. I mean, it just it fell off. With Gary buried, the thrill of their act began to fade. Boredom threatened to settle in once again. So Jimmy and Ricky looked forward to their next adventure. They left Northport and headed for California. They planned to survive by selling drugs. The next day, local police received an anonymous call. A young woman said she knew where Gary Lowers was buried. She said she knew who killed him. Only problem was the police didn't know that anybody named Gary Lowers was even missing. They thought it was a crank call. When the officer pressed the caller for her name, she nervously hung up. Ricky and Jimmy were having the time of their lives but they had completed only 160 miles of their cross-country odyssey when it was time to stop and raise more money. And when we got up there, we sold some Eskimo real quick, and we bought a car for 50 bucks, a junker. Neither one of them had an inkling of what was going on back home. The anonymous call was verified, and an investigation began. Police were led to a wooded area just on the outskirts of town. The area in question was fairly big uh, as a wooded area and kind of tough to deal with. We brought uh, four canine units with us. We sent two dogs in at a time. Uh, one dog did a hit, uh, found what he can, they considered to be a body. Police soon came upon a shocking discovery. So we walked over to where the dogs had hit and uh, we examined it very carefully and uh, observed a blood-soaked scalp. The remains of Lauer's shallow grave removed all doubt about the legitimacy of the mysterious phone call. A frantic search was on for the killers. Meanwhile, the unsuspecting duo decided to head back home. They had lost interest in their road trip and wanted to party with their friends on the 4th of July. We went downtown Northport and we tripped out and Ricky was handing out mescaline to people and we were all getting high and everything. When the party was over, Jimmy and Ricky went back to their car to get some sleep. Early the next morning, the police received a report of a suspicious vehicle. A lone officer responded. To his surprise, the suspects were helplessly asleep inside, without a care in the world. But having seen what these kids had done, he took no chances and called for backup. Authorities knew the pair could be capable of anything, especially if they were high on drugs. We approached the car. It's about 18 officers. Some uniform, some plain clothes. 
we have our weapons drawn. We have no idea what the kind of reaction we're going to get. We open the doors, they're sound asleep. Out of the window. I was like more dumbed out because I was still basically high from the night before. And, and I was surprised. I didn't even know that they were on to us. Like his friend Jimmy, Ricky Casso also was groggy when the police arrested him. But that soon passed. He started to wake up, and as he woke up, he went back to his normal, cocky, regular self. Ricky told police he knew nothing about Gary Lowers and that he hadn't seen him in some time. He and Jimmy were taken to the station where they gave their statements. This time, Ricky confessed. It was a, f a little frightening that he was almost proud about it. Um, he boasted about it. Uh, Ricky, in the statement he gave, claimed that as he was killing Gary, uh, he heard a crow call, and that based on that, he knew that the devil was, was pleased. Uh, it was a, a frightening thing to us to hear him talk like that and uh, just to dismiss this murder as nothing. Jimmy, too, was locked up, but the spotlight remained on Ricky and his satanic confession. That evening, the Suffolk County Police Department issued a press release. It said that Ricky Casso was a member of a satanic cult and worships and partakes in rituals honoring the devil. It also said that he cut out the victim's eyes and that he claimed the devil had ordered him to kill Gary Lowers. A media firestorm was ignited. Satan had come to suburbia and the event was not to be missed. News of the murder spread around the world. His eyes were cut out in what county police say was a satanic ritual. about a devil worshiping cult of teenagers. Victim stabbed repeatedly, and his eyes were cut out. Seventeen ritual, ritual murder. Police are searching for more cult members. Alarmed by the frenzy of publicity, Jimmy feared Ricky might do something drastic. He seen himself on the news that night, and everyone in the gallery knew that he was arrested for Satanism. I guess it made him a little more scared, because you know he didn't know what people would think in prison. The victim's father spoke out, trying to distance his son from Satanists like Ricky. My son was not involved in any drugs, and he was fearful of this kid, Ricky Castle, because he had been acquainted with him, maybe at a previous occasion, uh, from school and apparently also after school. So he was fearful of them. And it is my belief that he was abducted, that they were just waiting for him. They saw, they saw uh, my son as their victim that they needed and uh, abducted him somehow or other. The pressure was on. That night, having spent less than 48 hours in jail, Ricky Casso hanged himself in his cell. leaving behind his best friend, Jimmy Troiano, to stand trial for murder. Of the original gang of four, two were now dead. One was behind bars, and the fourth had agreed to testify and return for immunity. No one doubted that Jimmy had been a party to the murder, and everyone thought this would be an open and shut case. Northport, New York, was a quaint little town with a terrible secret. The brutal murder stripped bare its peaceful facade. Now, two of its children were dead, one by his own hand, 
another at the hands of his friends. That left two people to tell what happened in the woods that night. Jimmy Troiano and Albert Quinones, the fourth youth present during the killing that night. Quinones was granted immunity in exchange for his testimony. That left Jimmy Troiano as the sole defendant in a criminal trial facing a charge of murder. As the trial began, prosecutors prepared for what seemed like an open and shut case. I was fully confident that we would get a conviction because I knew that I had a signed statement of the defendant confessing, as well as an eyewitness that was present at the crime scene and would point to Mr. Triano as a participant in the murder. But the prosecution's confidence was a bit premature. Jimmy's attorney, Eric Nyberg, was famous for his successful defense in hundreds of criminal trials. Despite the overwhelming odds, he had a plan. When I first met Jimmy Triano, I sat down with him, obviously, and discussed the facts of the case, and he gave me a very strong and believable story. Uh, when I arranged the second meeting with Jimmy, I sat down, and he gave me a very strong and believable story. Of course, it had nothing to do with the first story. Uh, he did this again a third time. I then decided I was going to take him back to the scene of the crime, and while we were standing there, uh, he was taking me through it, and this was a fourth and very believable story. And I turned to him and I said, Jimmy, this is the fourth story you've given me. It's totally different than the others. And he turned to me and he said, Mr. Nyberg, when the trees are melting and the stars are racing across the sky, it's very hard to remember what happened. And it was at that moment that I realized how I was going to defend this case. While Nyberg sat back and built his defense, the prosecution introduced its secret weapon, Albert Quinones. He was the only one that was available to the prosecution that we were aware of that was actually present during the attack and during the, the murder itself. Quinones was no saint himself, and the police knew him well. But he was the prosecution's star eyewitness. Problem was, he was the prosecution's only eyewitness. In his initial statement to police, Quinones told prosecutors that Jimmy held Gary down while Ricky repeatedly plunged the knife into him. Forensic lab analysis also seemed to support this sequence of events. Something like 22 stabbing or cutting type wounds uh, going up and down the back the skull injuries were uh, in the facial area, something like seven or eight wounds there. One was a little lower down uh, just above the upper teeth, but mostly they were in the region of the left eye. This pattern of wounds uh, certainly would be what you'd expect uh, if someone were being held immobile uh, and then someone else were doing the stabbing who's right there just going up and down. But Quinones wasn't the ideal prosecution witness. Like the rest of the boys that night, he admitted to taking at least 10 hits of LSD prior to the murder. That raised a serious question. Were his recollections valid? Jimmy's lawyer didn't think so. He realized his best defense was a poor witness for the offense. My defense strategy was that what Mr. Quinones was going to say on the stand, and in fact what my client had given statements about, was unreliable. Their use and abuse of LSD had affected their ability to recognize and relate reality, and their testimony was just not going to be believed. When Quinones took the stand, Nyberg went to work. There was uh, testimony from him that he had seen a lion in the woods. Now, nobody believed there was a lion in the woods. But I said to Mr. Quinones, Mr. Quinones, uh, was there a lion in the woods? And he said, absolutely not. Then I said to him, but didn't you hear that there was a circus in town and a lion, a lion escaped from that circus? He said, you, you mean the lion was really there? Quinones' own words had mauled his credibility. On the stand, things went from bad to worse. He revealed he was more than just an unreliable witness. 
On cross-examination for the first time, he admitted that, in fact, just prior to the killing, he had taken part in an attack on the victim where he kicked and punched the victim along with Castle and Triano. And just when it looked as if things couldn't get any worse for the prosecution, they did. Quinones totally contradicted his prior statements to police. He now testified that he was positive that Jimmy never chased or held the victim down during the fatal stabbing. Despite the conflicting testimony of his star witness, the prosecution remained optimistic about their chances for success. There comes a point at the end of the case when the judge asks both attorneys, do you want a down charge? Do you want something less charged to the jury, such as manslaughter or criminally negligent homicide? And myself and the homicide squad took the position that it was murder or it was nothing. In what was perhaps a twist on the tale of good versus evil, Eric Nyberg made his closing statement to the jury. Ladies and gentlemen, I humbly and respectfully submit that only God Almighty knows or will ever know what happened that night. That if Jimmy Triano or Albert Quinones deserve to be punished, it is the Almighty who must make that decision. After three tense days of deliberations, the jury returned with a verdict in the so-called Satan trial. For the second degree murder of Gary Lowers, Jimmy Triano was declared not guilty. As quickly as it began, it was all over. Outraged and confused, the town struggled to understand what had just happened. I was surprised by the decision of jury. Um, I, I didn't understand it. We thought it was a pretty sure thing. Drugs had been indirectly responsible for taking Gary Lauer's life, and now their effect on the human mind was directly responsible for the trial's outcome. For many, it seemed that Satan was alive and well in Northport. In his name, the town had suffered one brutal murder, one suicide, and now the court decided that no one was responsible, except maybe for the devil himself. In nomine Dei Nostri, Satanas Luciferi Excelsi, in the name of Satan, the ruler. A dark force had descended upon the village of Northport, causing Gary Lauer's brutal murder. The crime went unnoticed and unreported, and ultimately, it went unpunished. Ricky Casso said the dark force was the devil himself. Black birds that night told him that Satan blessed his crime. And Ricky, to honor his master, told his victim to declare his love for Satan. The Satan connection had quickly taken on a life of its own. The murder was seen as a ritual sacrifice, but many considered it just the tip of the iceberg. The whole idea of, of Satan worship in a suburb being conducted under the nose of adults by their own children was uh, truly horrific for many, many people. Ricky became fascinated with Satan in an unlikely place, the Northport Public Library. Ricky wandered in one day and found himself drawn to some books turned out to be books on Satanism. It was as if everything within those pages was already inside his head. I think it was a progression with Ricky with Satanism. It, it, he thought it was inter interesting, and then it got more intriguing to him. I remember times walking down the street, and he would walk by a certain place and say, Hail Satan. Ricky worshipped Satan in his own way, although formalized practice has been around for centuries. The Church of Satan, located in New York City, 
purports to have several hundred thousand members worldwide. The attraction of Satanism is that it's the first religion in the history of the Western world to accept man as he really is. He's a carnal animal, a beast, and it's something to be exorcised, not exorcised. To its followers, Satanism is about celebrating man, not worshipping the devil. Satan, thy strength is mine. Drink in honor of your true nature. Satanists claim they don't even believe in the devil, per se. In nomine Dei nostri, Satanas Luciferi excelsi. Satan as a word has significance in many different contexts. In a Christian context, it's one of absolute evil and opposition to their God who represents absolute good. To a Satanist, Satan means adversary or opposer, which is the original meaning of the word. And we are the opposers of all who would try to make man spiritual rather than carnal. To those who have seen the effects of Satanism firsthand, it's not quite that harmless. For someone to say that Satanism or worship of the devil is something good is absolutely preposterous. Come forth from the abyss. Because the devil is evil incarnate. And Satanism, the worship or the honoring of Satan, is honoring not anything good, but everything that's wrong, everything that's evil. Ricky Casso needed something to believe in. Satan provided a degree of moral freedom irresistible to an aimless young kid living on his own, making his own rules. The attraction to satanic activity, the attraction to the devil, basically comes down to power. The devil will come and promise great power to anyone who follows him. And in doing that, the person doesn't know the price he's going to have to pay. Ricky used Satanism to pull a collection of Northport's disaffected youth into his circle. The kids went along for the ride because Ricky supplied the drugs that made it seem worthwhile. But Ricky's brand of Satanism came not from the tenets of organized Satanists, but from the world of music videos. Ever since Charles Manson touted the influence of the Beatles' Helter Skelter in 1969, rock music and Satanism have celebrated a marriage made in hell. And while Manson sought his inspiration in rock and roll, rock and roll took a page from Manson. Heavy metal music thrived on death imagery and ultimately satanic references. Real Satanists couldn't compare with a new breed of recording artists. For a generation raised on music videos that projected heavy metal imagery, Satan struck a chord with a small number of teenagers across the country. Satanism was a quick and scary sounding buzzword. Satan had polished up his image and gone mainstream to preach platitudes at the church of sex, drugs and rock and roll. The kids, with nothing else to do with their time, bought it. Uh, the real extreme was exemplified by Satanism and 666 and burning crosses in your arms and uh, when they latched onto that they really tried to you know take it to the extreme. They like to go around uh, telling people they say Satan's my man. Truth was their belief in Satan was no more real than those acts on TV. Ricky certainly spoke often of Satan but no one ever saw him involved in satanic rituals or animal sacrifices. Satan became Ricky's scapegoat, and the news media ate it up. The press release alluded to the satanic cult. The satanic cult never existed. Uh, there was some misinformation went out, uh, inaccurate information. But you can't stop the press. A cult of teenage suburban Satan worshippers became a convenient way to frame an otherwise unmotivated and gruesome crime, even if it wasn't necessarily true. For as much as the kids said they loved Satan, the press loved Satan even more. The press release that went out um, 
caused a frenzy which I've never seen or have seen since. Uh, we were completely unprepared for it. In truth, there was no satanic cult in Northport. Evil dwelled here, but in the form of drugs and lack of adult supervision, and a youth culture bombarded with satanic images from the media. Satan was merely a symptom, not the cause of what went so terribly wrong here. As a youngster, Ricky showed no indication that he'd be a troubled teen, but by the age of 11, he began smoking marijuana. His total transformation would take a few more years. When I first met Ricky, he, he was, I guess was around seventh or eighth grade, and uh, to me, he was, he was a pretty quiet guy. You know, short hair, pretty clean cut, just um, not, a, not an imposing person, just, just a quiet, decent looking guy. As he approached adolescence, Ricky struggled to find out who he was, what he was good at, and how he could stand out from the crowd. He was 13 and on the football team when he met his best friend, Jimmy Triano. Though Ricky's interest in football waned, his friendship with Jimmy grew. Because he was not scholastically, athletically, nor socially talented, Ricky dropped out of school by the time he turned 16. That left a vacuum in his life. Drugs rushed to fill it. I think Ricky was doing drugs as, as, as an escape. Any time that I would see him where he was tripping or he was high, he just seemed, it almost seemed as if he was in his element at that point. He was just, Ricky was, you know, drugged out Ricky. Just as his academic life found him wanting, Ricky's home life put pressure on him. His father was strict and Ricky rebelled against any form of authority. Soon he was not only using drugs, but selling them as well. To me, Ricky spiraled out of control. It had to be during ninth grade. He went from a pretty clean-cut guy. Next thing you know, within within a year, a year and a half period, he was the long hair, the, the concert T-shirts, um, just the, a whole total new look to himself. And it was quite obvious as he, that he was well into drugs at that point. Ricky also began to get into trouble with the law. Once he was caught stealing skulls from an old Indian cemetery, some thought it was part of a satanic ritual. But in the end, it was just Ricky being Ricky. He would sell them for drug money. Of course, Ricky wouldn't have succeeded if he hadn't found a ready market to peddle his wares. During school, school day during the week, around 12, 1 o'clock, kids would start either cutting out of school or they didn't even go to school, they'd end up here. People would come down here, trip out, a smoke pot, and just hang out and basically have fun. Normal people would walk by that are not high, and they, they gotta say, these kids are on something, you know, because they, they act like real lunatics sometimes. One of their favorite spots was the gazebo in the park down by the waterfront. A lot of the residents sort of objected to the teenage kids hanging out on, on Main Street. You know, we were under pressure to get rid of them. So we would force them down into the, to the parks. We, they figured we were a little, you know, the teenager kids and just hanging around town. And, and I guess in their minds, they'd rather us in plain view out here than in a neighborhood burglarizing houses or something, you know. While parents went off to their white collar jobs, their children participated in a parallel and equally thriving economy. The only laws they respected were the laws of supply and demand, and Ricky was the town's chief supplier. Um, I can remember a certain instance we were we were hanging out at a shopping center, Food Town in Northport, and I uh, it was it was kind of late at night, and uh, Ricky was standing in front of a pizzeria. And I just approached him, say, hey, Ricky, you know, what, what's going on? What are you doing? He says, oh, geez, I'm so stoned, uh, doing acid. He says, I was taking a leak and the toilet bowl melted. I said, really? He says, well, what'd you do? He says, oh, I just stuck it in my pants. I says, okay, <laughs> way to go. Ricky's parents tried everything to save their son. They enrolled him in a community drug program. 
they even committed him to a psychiatric hospital, but nothing seemed to work. By the spring of 1984, Ricky Casso's life began to revolve increasingly around drugs. It was around that time that Gary Lowers allegedly stole some from him at a party, setting in motion a chain of events that would see both of them dead within a month. The night Gary Lowers was murdered began in typical fashion. On, on the night of the murder, it was around 7, 8 o'clock at night, and me and Ricky and Alvo were hanging out, and Gary was like on another park bench further down. We were already dosing. We all took, took some acid, and we was tripping already. I, I felt a little tense between um, Ricky and Gary, but Ricky was being pretty cool about it and, and took Gary in, and that's why Gary, I guess, came with us. He wasn't, he wasn't forced or coerced into the woods, but we also we were high, so that was one way we got him into the woods. The case against Ricky Casso would have been clear-cut. Shortly after his arrest, he admitted to police that he murdered Gary Lowers. When we was in the jail cell, he, that's when he told me that he made a statement, signed a statement on himself, and I think that he did it, that I had nothing to do with it, and I was, I was surprised, you know, that he did all that. Jimmy had good reason to be surprised, because Ricky was lying, either to the police or to Jimmy. In Ricky's statement, he had related Jimmy's involvement in the slaying. I was holding him on the ground, and Jimmy kicked him in the ribs. I looked up at Jimmy, and Jimmy indicated to me to cut his throat. I then took out my knife and stabbed Gary. The knife went all the way in. Somehow, he got away and ran through the woods. I caught him and brought him back to where the fire was. I dropped my knife when I chased him, and Jimmy Troiano found it. Troiano gave me the knife, and I stabbed Gary in the back and the front a whole bunch of times. Me and Troiano dragged Gary back into the woods. We started to cover him up with leaves, and he sat up. I bugged out and started to stab him in the face. I didn't count how many times. I'm not really sure. I don't know what I said, but I said a whole bunch of satanic things. Also, according to the statement, Jimmy prolonged the violence by finding Ricky's knife and handing it back to him. From Ricky's account, Jimmy looked equally guilty. But the statement couldn't be used in court. Shortly after giving it, Ricky Casso hanged himself, rendering the document useless and inadmissible. Ricky wasn't the only one making a confession. In addition to the assorted retellings Jimmy shared with his lawyer, he also made two official statements. And true to form, they contradicted each other. To anyone who knew anything about drugs, that wasn't so surprising. After all, there was one thing everyone agreed upon. Before the murder, the boys were high on an enormous quantity of LSD and angel dust. Dangerous drugs on their own, taken together, they're a recipe for disaster. Nerve cells in the brain which normally talk to each other through a series of electrochemical impulses are interrupted, altering a person's sense of reality. LSD is a synthetic drug which produces hallucinations as its primary effect. It also does produce psychic effects, such as uh, altered sense of oneself such as of feelings of strangeness or what we call derealization. If you're in a bad mood, of course, it would just exacerbate your bad mood. It could make you uh, more tense, more violent, more, uh, more to act on what you're fantasizing about, whether it's punching somebody, killing somebody, uh, or just generally being uh, aggressive. Larger doses would only magnify the effect. That night, between all of us, we did 30, 40 hits. We done 10 hits apiece, and we smoked, I don't know, 17 bags of dust between the three of us. We were high. 
Under those circumstances, Jimmy's recollections were bound to be garbled, confused, and contradictory. His first statement said he was only an innocent bystander, but in the second, he admitted holding Gary down while Ricky plunged his knife repeatedly into his victim. Knife markings on the body were consistent with an immobilized victim, but Gary could have been unconscious with no need to hold him down. But we'll never really know. At his trial, Jimmy Triano exercised his rights as a defendant and chose not to take the stand. Had he testified, his conflicting statements, shifting story, and history of drug use may have worked against him. But his lawyer turned these liabilities into assets. Jimmy was just too far gone to know what he was talking about. Jimmy Traiano walked. But perhaps the most surprising and troubling thing about the murder was the casual attitude of their friends. As many as a dozen of them trekked through the woods to look at Gary's body. Here, at last, was something even better than music videos. They were inside on something very serious, intense. Uh, these kids were very bored. They were looking for something. And this was, uh, as it was true, there was a body there. This was real excitement. And as the word spread, uh, nobody really wanted it to go to the police or be the one who went to the police when this was such a, an inside thing. Physically, it was the worst crime I've ever seen. Uh, the fact that the young children, if you will, teenagers, uh, took the life of another brutally, not just quickly, brutally tortured. And after the, after the body is dead, left it there to rot and to be attacked by, the, uh, by, the, by nature, animals and, and, and the weather. The fact that they had to be told by visitors to the gravesite that they should have the courtesy to cover the body up. There's no feelings with these people. These people are animals themselves. It seemed like such an idyllic setting a seaside community where parents came to raise kids in prosperity and safety. So what went wrong? Was Northport an isolated incident, or was this only the beginning of something even bigger? The town of Northport is hardly the kind of place that springs to mind when you think of horrible crimes. The middle and upper class family community of around 8,000 people had only five reported homicides in its entire history. Safety was always part of its appeal. This is Northport. Uh, it's a beautiful little uh, seaside village on Long Island, about an hour and a half outside of New York City and uh, a million miles away from their problems. Or, uh, you know, so we thought. In this bedroom community of New York, parents would leave for the city each morning, letting their children fend for themselves, believing they were safe from corrupting influences. Ricky Casso grew up in what would seem to be the prototypically uh, ideal American suburban home. His, his father was a, a teacher at a, a local school. He was also a football coach. His mother was very concerned. And he lived in very much a supportive, type of community with good schools, everything that a, a kid could desire. And it, I guess it, the, the whole tragedy was compounded by this gnawing question about how could something so bad happen from something so seemingly good. Many of the kids didn't find it so good. They didn't care for big houses or big jobs. They were searching for something else. They needed some excitement. It was very much uh, what we would uh, picture suburbia to be. A lot of uh, middle to upper class white kids hanging out, looking for something to do. Uh, basically bored, bored with school, bored with their life, uh, you know, frustrated with their parents, 
pretty much the same uh, issues any you know any teenager would have. If kids were getting into trouble, many parents weren't around to know about it. Yeah, it, it just seemed that like, a lot of times kids were left and they'd come home from school and there wouldn't be anybody there. Kids were left to experiment on their own. A drug culture evolved in Northport's junior high school. The drugs really represented the, you know, what was the excitement, the real sport, what was going on at the time. School was not cool, sports were not cool, academic clubs weren't very uh, cool at all. But, uh, but taking drugs and taking these trips and getting wasted was pretty much the, uh, the mark of achievement at the time. In this respect, Ricky Casso was an overachiever. But when drugs weren't enough, he chose Satan. When Satan wasn't enough, he chose murder. And even Jimmy Troiano, who was there that night, doesn't really know why it happened. For some reason, if I asked Ricky to go do a burglary, he would not do no crime. But then again, he'll He'd commit a murder and then go tell 13, 14 people. I mean, it, it, it would baffle anyone. I mean, it baffles me why he did do that. Ricky's reasons will never be known. But whatever his motivations, he wasn't alone. In the years following the Northport incident, more reports of gruesome teen murderers cropped up in suburbs across the country. In 1996, 14-year-old Barry Lucatus walked into his algebra class and killed three people with a hunting rifle. One year later, 16-year-old Luke Woodham murdered three people, including his mother and ex-girlfriend. In 1997, 11-year-old Nathaniel Abraham became one of the nation's youngest murder defendants when he was charged with shooting an 18-year-old with a 22 caliber rifle. And in 1999, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold opened fire on their suburban Colorado high school, killing 13 people before turning their guns on themselves. Most of these killers came from loving homes, affluent communities, good schools. And if you look beneath the surface of those early killings, these were kids who um, just had a lot of anger at home. They were kind of um, disregarded and ignored. and. Um, different circumstances in each case, but an underlying theme of neglected kids, socially neglected kids, marginalized kids. It was no longer something we could attribute to poverty or race. It was just a general malaise and miscontent. Today, almost two decades after the murder of Gary Lowers, Northport has healed its wounds and is again a quiet, sleepy town on the shores of Long Island. The teenagers of 1984 are adults with children of their own. Jimmy Troiano has an infant son, James Troiano Jr. It was, uh, it was something that happened. I mean, uh, it, was, it was a bad thing, but life goes on. I mean, and I hope if you ever come to the same situation, uh, think, you know, just think before you react to anything. You know? And if you don't have drugs in your head, you'll think a little clearer. Today, Nearly 80% of all teenage deaths are the result of some sort of violence. In the last 30 years, teenage homicides have increased by 300%, and the trend is continuing. When kids kill kids, it's easy to blame drugs, rock and roll, or even the devil himself. But those who lived in Northport in the summer of 1984 know full well that even the tidiest of suburbs can be a place where evil dwells. <laughs>